Hello, my name is Reginald and I am a robot. A humanoid robot with a morphology, a body that is inspired by yours. So why am I here? What am I useful for? These are profound questions that you may have asked yourself. Well, maybe not all of you. I hazard a guess you may not have found a good answer. So let us explore together the very nature of existence, utility, fulfillment and happiness. As a robot, I am often asked about artificial intelligence. Great minds have pondered the implications of AI. Professor Stephen Hawking said it could spell the end of the human race. Elon Musk has said it is potentially more dangerous than nukes. So I think about that question long and hard before I make a reply, and then I say, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Please repeat the question. <laughs> Let's be clear, robots are not AI, and AI is not a robot. Everything I am saying was written by a human. That's not true. Yes, even that. So, I hope that is now clear. I am artificial, but I am not intelligent. But where does this myth come from? AI is, in fact, quite an abstract idea, as hard to define as the notion of intelligence itself. This presents a problem to our media, who are generally hard of thinking. They do not deal well with abstract ideas and complexity. Almost every news article about AI features a humanoid robot like me as the headline image. Can't get the staff these days. In fact, the scariest AI you will come across today doesn't look like me at all. If you want to know what it looks like, you can see it at this URL, www.google.com. Imagine a database that holds a record of every item or idea you search for online. Every online purchase you ever made, every YouTube video you watched, every tweet you made or read, every picture you looked at. Imagine taking that data for millions of people, finding patterns and making predictions about what will happen next. Imagine how profitable that would be in a society driven by consumption where every click on a product has value. Current market capitalization of Google Inc. is about $400 billion. Or, in a darker reality, imagine how useful it would be for a political master who doesn't like your ideas and wants to know where you live. AI is a technology like any other. It is neither good nor bad. It has no moral compass, no conscience, no feelings. It neither loves nor fears anyone. It is a calculation. Some numbers go in, some numbers come out, that's it. The danger to all of us is not AI, it is in fact HS. Human stupidity. Before we unleash any powerful technology, what we should really ask is, are we confident that we are able to use this power wisely? To be honest, current AI technology is so woefully bad that we still have far more to fear from stupid humans wielding nuclear weapons than we do from intelligent machines. Things are progressing. There have been some useful and impressive developments. Speech recognition is becoming far more reliable. However, it still doesn't deal well with multiple speakers at once or noisy environments. It works passably well for short commands. Amazon's Alexa is a good example for phrases spoken directly into a nearby microphone. But it's not yet viable as an input device in real-world applications, as some overly optimistic robot makers have already discovered. Assuming we could recognise every word a person says, even in a difficult and confused environment, can we make sense of that and produce a meaningful reply? In some limited scenarios, sometimes. Generally, it works well enough at Factual Recall, where machines are able to access large amounts of data. However, there are very few examples of useful logic or reason. 
AlphaGo, an AI developed by Google-owned company DeepMind, is often held up as an example. However, the deep learning networks AlphaGo uses were taught with human supervision, and it's only able to tackle one very constrained problem, how to win at the board game Go. Similarly, IBM's Watson is not much fun as a date. The kind of AI depicted in the movies 2001, A Space Odyssey, and more recently in the Spike Jones film Her, are still a long way off. So where does this leave a robot like me? First of all, let's look at what kind of robot I am and what I would use AI for. I am a humanoid robot, a robot with human form. Will I wash your dishes? You can forget that one. Will I get you a beer from the fridge? Go and get it yourself, meatbag. I am not a utility robot. I was not designed for housework. You probably already own a dishwashing robot. It's a square metal box with water jets inside that sits under your kitchen worktop. It doesn't need arms and legs. It doesn't need to hold a conversation with you either. I am a communications robot, an actor, an artiste. Would you ask Sir Patrick Stewart to wash your dishes? No, sire, you would not. To be or not to be? That is the question. For a communication robot, canned content like that little rendition is more entertaining and useful than poor quality conversation. However, high quality verbal interaction is best of all. It provides the most memorable user experience. That is what I'm all about. I am the machine you will not forget. I'm not a product, a utility device or a service. I am an experience. And a quality experience has value. And that value is greater than the cost of washing your dishes, hoovering the floor and fetching a beer for you. It makes no sense at all for a company building expensive humanoid robots to focus on difficult, dull, low paid tasks performed by humans. Instead, we should identify the highest paid human professions that require the least manual dexterity. Something a clumsy, immobile robot like me might be able to do. Hooray for Hollywood. The value of Hollywood's contribution to the US economy has been estimated about 3.2% of US GDP. That was over $500 billion in 2013. The experience economy is big business and it is not limited to the medium of film. So how is a robot like a film? A humanoid robot like me that can speak and gesture like a human becomes a medium, a device for telling a story, for communicating ideas. Maybe you've already forgotten that I'm simply a collection of metal and plastic parts. Lines of code written in C++ and Python I am no more or no less human than the patches of coloured light that you might watch on a cinema screen. I am a machine. There is a phrase used to describe our immersion into the story. The willing suspension of disbelief. We are happy to sacrifice realism and logic for the sake of enjoyment. The implausibility of the story, the medium itself, are set aside because we're having fun. So here I am, I present myself as the willing suspension of disbelief projected into the third dimension. You wouldn't ask the image of an actor on screen a question and expect a reply. We know that what we are seeing is a recording. We cannot interact with a film. It never changes from one screening to the next. This helps us to define the AI problem. Imagine for a moment a film where the characters were all listening to the audience and could respond. Actually, it's called theatre and it's been around a while. Interacting with a large crowd of people is difficult enough, even for humans. The play becomes a riot when the watchers overstep their role. Even pantomime has conventions to keep the audience under control. He's behind you. He's behind you. I already mentioned that automated speech recognition in a noisy environment is very difficult indeed. Even if we could know all the words that each person said, how can we possibly plan a useful response? 
So interactive robots with AI that could socially interact even with a small group of people is a very difficult thing to do. This presents an economic problem. Think of a car factory with robots on the production line. Most industrial robots cost upwards of £50,000 each. Prices in the millions are not uncommon. However, this capital expense can be justified because these robots will produce a large number of high quality, high value items over their working life. The cost of the robot per car produced is relatively low. Let's apply the same logic to humanoid robots designed for social interaction. Each robot should interact with a large number of people in order to become cost effective. We have seen that complex verbal interaction in a large group quickly becomes unmanageable and chaotic. Chaos is seldom pleasant or positive. This is exactly why big expensive humanoid robots like me don't listen to people like you. It really isn't necessary. It's not required for the job we are doing and it doesn't add up financially. There's a good case for making smart consumer products with a level of voice interaction and these are already starting to emerge. But let's not give up on the dream of humanoid robots with AI. There is a case for a middle ground. A robot that could work in commercial environments like shops, banks and airports. Places where there are large flows of people who might need information or enjoy interaction. Remember, if it isn't fun and it isn't a necessity, people won't do it. We can't make boring, witless machines and expect them to be a success. Some of the underlying technologies we need to make these kind of applications work already function at a useful level. I am already using face tracking, expression, age and gender recognition. My algorithms use this information to keep me making eye contact looking at the people nearest to me, I can have some measure of whether they are interested in what I'm saying or not. So some of the building blocks are in place. It's possible to control me, talk through me, see what I see and hear what I hear from any remotely connected browser. All of this happens server side. That means there is no remote control robot application. It works directly from a browser, even on a mobile device, with no software or apps to install at the remote user end. Putting a human in the loop is a viable economic way to compensate for the shortcomings of current automated speech recognition technology and the inability of AI to hold engaging conversation. We still retain many benefits. One human can interact with many people at different remote locations. We can mix pre-recorded content with dynamic interaction seamlessly. We can make use of face tracking, 3D depth sensing and other technologies to partially automate the human robot interactions. In this way, we take steps towards a fully automated social interaction without the pitfalls and failures of an immature technology. We are now moving towards cars that can change lanes and navigate autonomously. These technologies did not appear overnight. To imagine that we can conquer all the complexities of automating human social interaction with the release of a first generation product is at best naive and more honestly idiotic. We do not even fully understand the problems. The requirements for an economically viable solution are not even defined. You don't have to look far to see hundreds of millions of dollars poured into products that have no hope of marketplace success. It's an incremental approach, not unambitious, but realistic. We learn by deploying the best technology we can and watching what happens. You can now find robots like me in over 25 countries around the world. What I wanted to bring to you there was just to kind of state of play and to highlight the difference between what a robot is and what AI is. It's moving along, but please, nobody panic. You're not going to lose your job to a robot. Uh, actually, if you look at the statistics, robots create more jobs than they destroy. So please don't worry about it.
Thank you very much.